Did you know that you don't need a radiograph to diagnose symptomatic OA in the hip or knee? Keep on watching to learn this and much more based on the 2020 practice guideline. <laughs> Check out our online courses now. The link is in the video description. Hi and welcome back to Fissure Tutors. OA is the most common musculoskeletal disorder with hip and knee OA at its top. The medical world has much more to offer than simply replacing the joint. This is in contrast with many beliefs. The Royal Dutch Society for Physical Therapy published this guideline to provide clear recommendations for practice. Let's see what a physical therapist can contribute. We'll start off with history taking. We need to get a detailed picture of the patient in front of us. Figure out why the patient is there with you and what his or her expectations are regarding therapy and the course of symptoms. How did the pain start? Is your patient experiencing constant or intermittent pain, pain on exertion, at night or at rest? Where is this pain and how long does it last? Is there any swelling? Did the pain come up suddenly? Is there any pain in the calf when raising the foot? Because this could be a red flag for any replacement. Is there any morning stiffness? If so, for how long? Are there any movement restrictions or muscle strength deficits? Are there any recent changes to any of these? Does the hip or knee appear swollen or is it hot? Is there a feeling of giving way or instability? You should know about present risk factors of OA to weigh into your diagnostic conclusion. Here are a few things to ask about. Does the joint appear in an abnormal position? Is there a history of surgery or trauma? Is the patient overweight? Are there any congenital abnormalities of the hip? Are there any symptoms in other joints? Now that we ask about functional and anatomical factors, we progress to activity and participation related questions. Your first question can simply be, are there any activity limitations, for example, walking, stairs, picking up things, self-care, getting in and out of the car, and are there any restrictions related to transportation, and what makes the pain worse, what does it make it feel better, to what extent is weight bearing during daily activities possible, did your patient fall in the previous year, are there any challenges related to work, sport, or leisure? And what are the physical demands of these activities? Are there any social difficulties due to the pain or the functional limitations? There are many more questions to ask and pause this video to see questions related to external and personal factors. Now, when do you know if your patient can benefit from physical therapy? The guideline panel came to the conclusion that a patient can benefit when there are OA related limitations in daily activities or participation or when independent physical functioning is impossible. Patients can be categorized in four groups. Group number one will do with just a bit of advice or exercise instructions. Group number two will require a short period of guidance and supervision on top of that. Group number three requires this for a longer period of time. Finally, in group four are the ones that will get operated on and will need pre and or post-operative care. On to treatment. As you can probably tell from the groups, advice tailored to the patient's individual needs is one of the core treatment modalities. The authors stress that this should be supplemented with written or online information in form of leaflets, handbooks, websites or videos of proven quality. Now, what topics come to mind? You could discuss the condition and possible consequences of OA, the importance of exercise and healthy lifestyle and treatment options. If the patient considers arthroplasty or already has an appointment with a surgeon, there are several more topics to discuss. You should explain the surgery and the subsequent rehab and the fact that he or she will need assistive devices and help from others. Depending on the surgeon and the surgery, there could be various lifestyle restrictions and precautions to be aware of. Your patient should know that remaining fit pre-operatively is important. Most patients will have a lot of questions. This will make tailoring the information pretty easy. Now that we've covered education, we can dive into exercise. Exercise has a moderate effect on physical functioning in both hip and knee OA. 
Oftentimes, there is this restraint against exercise due to the belief of worsening the condition altogether. However, undesirable effects and worsening of symptoms are infrequently reported and not very severe. The benefits clearly outweigh the risk, and this is why exercise receives a strong recommendation from the panel. We can even stretch this to pre-operative care. Here too, exercise results in moderate improvements in physical functioning for both hip and knee replacements. In terms of postoperative care, moderate improvements by exercise appear yet again in hip replacements, but have small effects in knee replacements. Therefore, the panel concludes with a conditional recommendation for exercise pre and postoperatively. Now, exercise is a pretty broad term that lacks specificity. The authors reviewed the exercise program within the RCTs and came to a number of conclusions. Your program should have individual goals in mind for the person in front of you. Every patient will have different requirements for physical functioning and different activity levels. Discuss this and build your program around it. There is a need for joint specific exercises and general exercises. Home exercises and their frequency will depend on the goals of the patient. The authors recommend using the FIT principles. First, frequency. Your patient should preferably exercise daily. However, this is not always practical. The guideline advises muscle strengthening or functional exercises at least twice a week. Adding to this, your patient should have at least 30 minutes of aerobic exercise five times per week. You can start your patient by exercising once or twice per week under supervision and progress later on. So what do they mean by muscle strengthening? You can start off with 50 to 60% of the 1RM and progress up to 60 to 80%. Aim for two to four sets per exercise with 30 to 60 seconds of rest in between. Target the large muscle groups of the hip and knee. Of course, you are not going to test their 1RM. You can estimate that using a 1RM calculator with, for example, a 12RM. In terms of aerobic training, start exercising at 40 to 60% of the maximum heart rate and progress to 60% and above. Examples are rowing, walking, cycling, swimming, or a cross trainer. Gradually increase both aerobic exercise and strength training to a maximum level for your patient. If joint pain increases for more than two hours after the workout, consider scaling down the intensity. Implement balance, coordination, or neuromuscular exercises if there are any disturbances there. If there are range of motion deficits, stretching or active exercises can be added as well. Aim for 8 to 12 weeks of treatment supplemented with so-called booster sessions. Booster sessions contain a focus on long-term adherence to exercise, advice on physical activity and integration into their everyday lives. These can be spread out over future weeks or months. Always offer exercise both supervised and independently, regardless of your patient's specific demographics, and always supplement this with advice and education. It doesn't matter how severe the damage is or how old your patient is, you should provide this. If your patient suffers from a severe comorbidity or poor pain coping and you lack the knowledge to manage this, a referral or cooperation with a competent therapist is indicated. So that covers exercise. Is there more to it? Are there any other evidence-based treatment strategies? The authors investigated massage, tens, passive mobilization, either continuous with a device or manual, pulse electromagnetic field therapy, low-level laser therapy, shockwave, taping, ultrasound, and thermotherapy. The conclusion was pretty clear. These should not be offered. However, if your patient is in severe pain that impedes exercising, a short-term TENS intervention can be beneficial. That's it for this video. I hope you learned something today. I am Max for Physiotutors and I will see you in another video. Bye.